God, I am that I am, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the ending, the one who is the one who is to come, the Almighty. We bless your name. We thank you for waking us up this morning. All of us are saying good morning to you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Because it's your mercy, because of your mercy that we are not consumed. Thank you that this mercy is renewed every day. Thank you because it's not everyone who slept yesterday who is alive today. Thank you, Lord. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. Thank you for the journey mercies you granted to our royal fathers and mothers yesterday. Thank you because we are sure that you will grant them journey mercies when they are going back. Father, accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Almighty God, we are praying that this morning you will please speak to us. Amen. And as we are sending your word, let the power in your word bring healings to all of us. Amen. At the end of everything, Lord, let your name be glorified again. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Will you please uh, shake hands with one or two people and say good morning. God bless you today. Very good. <clears throat> I want to say good morning to all my fathers and my mothers, and I hope you slept well. Uh, I, I hope the accommodation is not too bad. I know it's not, not be exactly palace-like. But uh, we are trusting God that uh, the future will be more glorious in Jesus' name. Uh, I understand that some of our fathers have an important engagement in Abekuta by around 10. So I will hurry as much as possible. Because I know from here to Abekuta will take some 30 minutes or so. So I won't be as long as uh, I would have been. I wasn't planning to sit down, but uh, my children, since I turned 80, have been treating me as if I'm an egg. <laughs> and uh, if they give me a chair, I think I won't waste their efforts with your permission. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, let's open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 4. And I will read verse 17. Daniel chapter 4, 
verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers. And the demand by the word of the holy ones. Uh, some people are clapping. Oh. You mean you are not hearing? Lord have mercy. <laughs> I did you hear my question anyway. <laughs> Brethren, what's happening? I think they were hearing yesterday. Are you doing something about it or may I, may I just kindly request the Oloris to come and sit behind their husbands? That way there won't be any. I don't want you to miss a single word. Thank you for signaling that you aren't hearing clearly. God bless the Oloris. Because they are the one taking care of the cabbages, God will take care of you too. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will and set it up over it the basis of men. The most high rules in the affairs of men. Who is the most high? God is higher than the highest. His throne is in the heavens. All the other thrones are here on earth. And the earth, he uses as his footstool. That tells us how high he is. He says he rules. Is the one in control. How does he rule? Psalm 115 verse 3. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does as he pleases. He's the original majesty. He does as he pleases. Daniel chapter 4, verse 35. Daniel 4, 35 says, Nobody can even ask him, What are you doing? That tells us he's the original majesty. He does something, and he says, If you don't like what I have done, sue me. Let me know who will be your, your lawyer. Tell me the judge before whom I will appear. He rules by decrees, which is why he's called the King of Kings, because all kings are expected to rule by decrees in their domain. That's the way it was. And left to me as an individual, if I have the power, that's the way 
he should return to be. Oh, we thank God for presidents and governors, etc., etc. Et but if we cite these scriptures very well, it is the king that appoints presidents in those days. It is the king who will say, all right, I have this domain. Uh, I want people who will be helping me to manage. And then he will appoint presidents. Presidents are nothing but high chiefs. I, I pray that the Almighty God will restore the glory of the kings. Yeah. Now, he is so powerful. The Almighty God is so powerful that he says in Amos chapter 4 verse 7, Amos chapter 4 verse 7, he said, when I like I will reign on one city and leave the other city dry so that the city where I refuse to reign can come to the city where I have reigned to beg for food. He is the Almighty. He's called the Most High. And when you study him, you will know uh, he's someone to be feared. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, Proverbs 21, verse 1, that the heart of kings are in the hands of the Lord. And he can turn it like rivers. Want a river to bend this way, will bend it this way. If he wants it to go straight, it will go straight. Because it's in charge. And there are several reasons why he has the right to say, I'm in charge. Because he created all things. All things. Now, what you will find very interesting about him is if he wants to destroy a people, he goes straight to the king and hardens his heart. He will cause the king to do things you would think he shouldn't do. For example, in Exodus chapter 7, from verse 1 to 5, Exodus 7, from verse 1 to 5. He told Moses, I'm going to harden the heart of Pharaoh so that he won't let my people go so I can show him signs and wonders. <laughs> Poor Pharaoh. He had no choice until he was drowned with his whole army. God said, I will harden his heart. You remember I said yesterday, the Bible tells us that when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked is reigning, the people mourn. I will give you the impression, oh, whatever is happening in a a domain is the fault of the king. <laughs> it's the one who is called the Most High is the one controlling these hearts. Let me give you another example. In Second Chronicles chapter one, from verse six to fifteen, Exodus, sorry, Second Chronicles chapter one, from verse six to fifteen. The Bible talked about a young king called Solomon. He was what you would call a dull boy. He, he hasn't got much sense. 
He was a spoiled child. Then he became a king. And just woke up one day and said, I'm going to say thank you to God. I'm going to offer him a thousand born sacrifice. I'm going to sacrifice a thousand cows to God. Nobody had done that before. When he finished, and all the priests were amazed, <laughs> by the time they slaughtered the first cow, second, third, by the time they got to the seventh, they were looking at Kabesi. What's going on? Nobody has offered more than seven offerings at a time. He said, we haven't started. Just keep on bringing the cows until he sacrificed a thousand cows. And, and they must, they, I'm sure the priest must have been looking at themselves and said, okay, we knew he was a dull, witted king, but now I think he has gone completely mad. That night, God visited him and said, ask what you want. I give you a blank check. And then he said, I, I can reign over these people that are like uh, dust of the earth. Better you put me here. Eh? If I ask for anything at all, it is wisdom to do your work, to rule over your people correctly. God said something when he said, all I want is wisdom and understanding. God said, because this is in your heart, because that's what your heart asks you to do, I will do what you ask for. And all the things you didn't ask for, I will give it, give it to you. The question is, who puts this thing in his heart? Because God is the controller of the hearts of kings. The first time I read that place, uh, that was the question that came to my mind. How can somebody who is dull-witted suddenly decided he was going to offer a thousand burnt offerings? How come that the boy who was so dull, he himself knew he was dull? Because when someone is desperately thirsty, if you ask him, what do you want? He will ask for water. This boy knew he lacked wisdom. That's what he asked for. If he wasn't wise, how did they know that he should worship God in an extraordinary manner? And I prayed and God showed me it was a setup. Because the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 12, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24, the Bible says God loved Solomon. When God loved Solomon, he wanted to do something for Solomon that he had never done for anybody before. So he puts it in Solomon's heart to do what nobody else has done before. That's what the Englishman will call a setup. When God wants to bless a people, he will put in the heart of the king, the ruler of the people, do this so that I can do for you what I'm not doing for others. I pray for all my royal fathers. That which will bring tremendous blessings to your people. May God put it in your heart today. Yeah. I've told a story before. That when God wants to bless you, he will set you up. Put something in your heart to do 
that nobody else had done. So he can do for you what he's not doing for others. Years ago, when the church was much more smaller than this, we are still small. We are growing by the grace of God. Father in the Lord called a, work, a meeting of the workers. Uh, my children, the church has a very special need. And that special need must be met immediately. And so, he said, all of us should go and close our accounts and bring the Oh, say, yes, sir. But how can we go and close our accounts? I mean, if the pastor says, everybody, we need money urgently, uh, we want you all to bring 10, 10 naira or 1, 1,000, we can see, think about that. But he said, everything we have in savings, we should go and bring to the church. We left. We got home. My wife closed her account. I closed mine. It wasn't much, but that's all, all we had. And brought the money to the church. The following Sunday, Papa called the meeting of all the workers again and said, Well, uh, thank God the needs have been met. We got enough money. Close your account, like I said. I raised my hand. My wife raised her hand. And I look around. Nobody else is raising his hand. Ah. So I looked at my wife, and she looked at me. And immediately I began to think. Are you sure you are not receiving this thing with madness? Because nobody else is doing what we have done. And I heard God say clearly, my son, you are not mad. It's a setup. I want you to do something nobody else has done so I can do for you what I've done for nobody. Today, when people see what God has done, <laughs> when we got to this land, we, we had four and a half acres. Today, you can see a city. He hasn't done it for any pastor like that before. He is doing something as a result of the setup. My beloved fathers and mothers, may the Almighty God set you up for good. Yeah. Now, when you read First Kings chapter four, from verse twenty-four to twenty-five, First Kings chapter four, twenty-four to twenty-five, the Bible said. All the days of Solomon, there was peace in Israel. All the days of Solomon, there was peace everywhere. Solomon is the only king you can read about in the Bible who never fought a war. In those days, as a matter of fact, the history of every king had always been, they, this year, they fought this fellow, they were defeated. Next year, they fought the other one, they defeated. That was the, that's the history. You can read it 
in the Bible. Read the Kings, read the Chronicles, it is always war after war. But Solomon, throughout his reign, not a single war. Nobody ever thought of fighting him. I want peace to reign in all your domain. I don't want this issue of kidnapping near your domain. I don't want to hear of any evil reports in your domain. Because God can do it. He says, I can reign on one city and keep the other city dry. He can do it. He is the Almighty. He can prosper your domain so mightily that people will ask, how is this happening? I can tell you stories, but because I know you are in a hurry, I will be brief. Now, when you now put all this thing together, that if he wants to trouble a particular nation or a particular domain, it will cause the king to offend him, cause him to do some terror. It will harden his heart. When he wants to bless a people, it will soften the heart of the king, cause the king to begin to do things that will please him, so he will reward them. So that if anybody wants to raise a query, he will say, ah, what's the problem? This is what that king did. That's why his people got into trouble. This is what the other king did. That's why his people got the blessings. He made a statement in Romans chapter 9, from verse 15 to 18. Romans 9, 15 to 18. He said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. He said, that's my choice. And like I said earlier, if you don't like what I say I want to do, sue me. <laughs> I mean, we're talking of a God so powerful that he can just tell anybody to stop breathing because he's the, he's the controller of the air. The most important element in the world is the air you breathe. Thank God, that's why he made it free. Because if air was for sale, many poor people would have died. And all he has to do is to say to a king, come over and see me. And that's the end of the show. I remember years ago when uh, one governor said that he was going to revoke our certificate of occupancy of the land here. And I said to him, Your Excellency, I am from Oshun State. If I say I need land in Oshun State, my people will give me land. But it's God who said, I want to hear. And he is the owner of the earth. And the excellency was not listening. So I had to humbly suggest to him, if you say you want to revoke the certificate of occupancy of the one who asked me to come and stay here, uh, what if he revokes the certificate of occupancy of you on earth. Because the earth where you are living, 
belongs to God. You are here because he grants you certificate of occupancy to be on earth. If he revokes your certificate of occupancy, you won't be around to revoke my own certificate of occupancy. That was set to the quarrel. I said it gently, because, you know, <laughs> I'm an ordinary pastor. I think he thought about it and said, we better leave these people alone. The Almighty God would tell the devil to leave your domain alone. Yeah. Now, he said, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. I will show compassion unto whom I will show compassion. And he was talking at that time of even two children, twins, in the same womb, before they were born. He said, I love Jacob. I hate Esau. But you are the one creating the two. The two haven't done good. They haven't done evil. He said, I just want everybody to know. I am the most high. I do what I like. If anybody I like, I will show him mercy. Anyone I don't like will get mercy. He said, for example, that's why I created Pharaoh. I kept on lifting him up so that when, I, when he crashes, everybody will know. I just want to show who is the king of kings. I mean, you elders have a saying. You said if a cockroach falls, nobody hears the sound. If an ant falls, the ground is not going to tremble. But when an elephant falls, it will tremble on earth. So occasionally, he will raise up somebody and begin to raise him up higher and higher and higher. So that when he brings him down, everybody will pay attention. I pray for you, my beloved fathers, that God will show you mercy. Yeah. He showed me mercy. <laughs> and that's why I'm where I am today. I'm not in any way better than any other pastor. Not at all. Many, many pastors are superior to me in Bible knowledge, in everything. I, I never went to a Bible college. I'm a mathematician. Mathematicians normally don't want to, they don't, we don't want to hear about religion. We always say Christianity and mathematics, they are parallel lines that they don't meet. Why? The mathematician will say, if you prove it, I will believe it. Christianity says, if you believe it, I will prove it. They are supposed to be opposites. And I was a very rough boy among the, my colleagues in the universities. When we meet in the club, after we've taken a bottle or two of beer, when we have nothing else to discuss, we begin to make mockery of Jesus Christ. Thinking we are brilliant because we are lecturers. And then he went in the midst of these blasphemers and grabbed me and brought me out. I said, okay, you have blasphemed me enough. Now come and preach me. Mercy. May the Almighty God show every one of us mercy. But I discover one thing. When God said, this is what I want to do, he would leave a gap for you to maneuver and get him to do for you what you want from him. It's just like a river. 
The river is flowing downhill. And you want to get to a particular spot. If you are wise, you will jump into the river and flow in the direction of the river. It is when you begin to row against the river, that's when you get into trouble. When you flow with the river, you know the Englishman has a proverb, if you can't beat them, join them. You can't beat God. You are not wise enough to fight him. You are not strong enough to fight him. All you know is today. Nobody knows tomorrow. Only God can tell who among all of us will still be alive by this time tomorrow morning. Only God. There's no prophet who can tell you, eh, don't mind anybody, you're going to be here for another 10 years. <laughs> who says so? He said, ah, don't you know I'm a prophet of God? Even the prophet of God, does he know if he'll be alive by tomorrow? Now he now says, I show mercy to whomsoever I like, anybody I like, show him mercy. Anyone I don't like, I will cancel mercy. But he now said in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, Proverbs 28, verse 13, he said, anybody who conceals his sin will not prosper. He said, but anyone who will confess and forsake his sin will obtain mercy. He said that's the formula. You want mercy? Forsake your evil ways. Confess your sins. And say to God, I surrender. <laughs> Forgive me for using myself as an example. And I'm about to close so that like I promise you, I'll be, I will close as close to nine as possible. I thought I was clever. Because I, my ambition was I want to become the youngest vice chancellor in the world. I thought I was clever. I mean, before I was 30 years old, I was already... Uh, acting head of department in a very big university. I had built a house, I had bought a car, everything was working well. Until one day, somebody took me to the Redeemed Christian Church of God. And they were preaching. And they were saying, give your life to Jesus Christ. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Uh, in those days, uh -huh. majority of the pastors just managed uh, standard six, as they call it in those days. And here was I, <laughs> lecturer in the university. I look at them. What are they talking about? What do they know about philosophy? They, what do they know about psychology? Telling me to surrender my life. What, what do they know about sin? But one day, God penetrated, penetrated true to me because he, he just wanted to be merciful. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Confess your sin. Forsake them. It, that day, for the first time since I started going to the church, the word penetrated. And I said, wait a minute. They are not asking me to surrender to a man. They are asking me to surrender to my maker. And since I've been sinning, what have I gained anyway? 
When they made the altar call, I went forward. I knelt before the Most High God. I told him, from now, you take over my life. Whatever you say, I will do. And he took over. And things began to change. Oh, if I, if I seem to be boasting, I'm only boasting about the power of God, not myself. Anybody who knows anything about universities, good universities, will tell you that if a lecturer gets promoted once in three years, he's doing very well. After I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I was promoted three times in two years. It has never happened before. It's not likely to happen ever again. Why? Mercy. I told a story. When I was graduating at Oberfemme Oloa University, in those days, they used to call it University of Ife. The day I was graduating, the Kabiesi, that's Baba Derem, in, this was 1967, was given a honorary doctorate degree. Kabiesi came, drums, everything, it was so beautiful. So my friend, my best friend and I, we were talking about the beautiful thing that happened. And I said, one day, I'm also going to get a honorary doctorate degree. My friend looked at me and said, <laughs> you? He said, they don't give honorary doctorate degree to Dick and Harry. He said, if it is something you study for, we can understand. But this one? They only give it to very special people, people who don't need any other thing. That's the people they give on. And I looked at him, and he was speaking the truth. I was a Dick and Harry. But today, by the grace of God, I have eight honorary doctorate degrees. Eight of them. In Nigeria, abroad, I mean, Canada, America, they offered me one. In America, the first Christian university in America said, we want to give you a honorary doctorate degree. I said, I'm sorry, I'm busy. And they said, we will come to Nigeria and give it to you here. The point I'm making is this. No matter how great we think we are, we don't know greatness until we surrender to the one who can promote. The moment we surrender to him, we begin to enjoy his mercy. And when God begins to live to us, the Bible says his hands are everlasting hands. He will just keep lifting you up forever. If human beings lift you up, they will soon get tired of lifting you up. The very people who are lifting you up are the people who will turn against you. So I'm begging my fathers in the Lord and my fathers, traditional fathers, if only we can make up our mind to surrender completely to God. Everything that we had lost, we will get back. So may I ask that you please uh, bow your heads in prayer. And if, since you are all among your peers, this is, we're not among uh, little, little people. We are all high and mighty. If there's any of us who will want to say, please pray for me, I would like to surrender my life to Jesus Christ 
today. All I'm going to ask you to do is to please stand up where you are, and then I will pray that God will receive you, save your soul, and things will begin to change, even for the better from now on. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can see so many people standing. I thank God. Please, it's, it's between you and God now. It's between you and your maker. It's the one we are asking you to surrender to. The one who reigns and rules in the affairs of men. Thank you very much. Any other person? I want to pray so that uh, we can begin to round up. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other person? All you need to do is just stand where you are, and I will pray for you there, and we will leave the rest to the Almighty God. Thank you. Thank you. Any other person? This is the final call. The choice is yours. It's between you and your maker. Thank you, Father. Well, don't stand just talk to God for two minutes and say, God, I'm surrendering my life to you. Please save my soul, and I will serve you for the rest of my life. Talk to him before I pray. God, I'm surrendering my life to you. You can see me now. I'm standing up as a sign of total surrender to you. Have mercy on me. Forgive all my sins, and I will serve you for the rest of my life. Thank you, Father. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Okay, I see, see some people just decided. Thank you, Father. Glory be to God. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise God. I'm about to pray now. If there's anyone who still just decided, tell the devil to leave you alone. You are surrendering to your maker. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you again. Thank you, Almighty God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. My Father, my God, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your word, and I want to thank you for your children who are standing up now as a sign of surrender to you. Please, Lord, receive them in Jesus' name. Let your blood wash away their sins, save their souls, and write their names in the book of life. And from now on, let them begin to enjoy your mercy. Please, Lord, any time they cry unto you from today onward, answer them by fire. And Lord God Almighty, as they go back even to their domains, let them begin to shine for you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, those of you who stood up. You can please fill the card they gave you so that I can begin to pray for you on a daily basis. Thank you very much. Now, before my closing prayer, maybe you have individual shall I call it requests? I don't want to say problems. <laughs> but I know very well as the Englishman will say, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. You are carrying the bodies of so many people, and you have your own private problems. If you have a special request, something you want God to do for you, particularly to mark this occasion, I give you two minutes now to talk to God about it. And then I will join my faith with yours and we will pray that God will solve the problems. So please ask God for something special. 
Ask God for a miracle. A miracle that you know he is the only one who can perform. Ask him for something that will be a landmark for this occasion. Something that you will remember this special convention by. Ask him. Thank you, Father. Let us begin to bring our prayers to a close. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. My Father and my God, I want to bless your holy name. I want to thank you most sincerely for putting it in the hearts of these, your children, to come to this convention. They could easily have said, we are busy. They could easily have said, who is calling? But no, you put it in their hearts to come because you have a special love for them. Thank you, Lord. And because you have brought them, my Father and my God, from today onward, let them begin to enjoy your mercy. <laughs> In their domains, my Father and my God, let there be peace. <laughs> let there be progress. <laughs> let there be prosperity. <laughs> All those causing problems, in their domains. My Father, my God, it is written in your word that every plant you have not planted shall be rooted up. Every troublemaker in their domains, because they came, Father, uproot them. <laughs> Anyone disturbing the peace of the domains of your children, Father, I pray, even before the end of this month, let these people vanish. <laughs> in the domains of your children, till we see you in glory, let there be peace. <laughs> let there be progress. <laughs> let there be joy. <laughs> let there be mighty miracles. <laughs> let there be testimonies. <laughs> Father, I'm praying for your children. Whatever they have asked you today, before the sun sets, let it become a testimony. <laughs> As they be going back home, Father, go with them. <laughs> On their way, let there be miracles. <laughs> At home, let miracles be waiting for them. <laughs> and all the glories of the traditional rulers, my Father and my God, even by the time we have the next government, let it be fully restored. Yeah. Empower them again. Yeah. Anoint them again. Yeah. And I pray, Lord God Almighty, that they too will serve you. Yeah. That they will use their position, Lord God Almighty, to turn over their domain to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Let it be well with them. Yeah. And Lord, I pray that in your kingdom, not one of them will be missing. Amen. Thank you, my Father. Glory be to your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you all. And safe journey as you go back. I hand over now to the organizers. Thank you very much. Let's keep on clapping our hands. Let's appreciate the Lord Jesus.